Okay. So, uh, so my name's uh, Drew Taylor. I'm one of the founders and, and CEO of AstroPrint. Uh, quick little nutshell, uh, AstroPrint, uh, what we're moving towards, what the vision of the company is, is to be the Android and the Google Play for the 3D printing industry. Right? So then what that is, is basically we're a software company uh, uh, that makes 3D printing really easy to use and highly functional. One side of our company is software that can actually operate a 3D printer, and our goal is to make them, again, incredibly simple uh, so that anyone can operate the printer without the need for uh, incredibly technical skills. Right? Uh, the other side of our software is a cloud-based app store where uh, third parties can deliver content or applications directly to 3D printers from the internet. Right? So uh, what I'm gonna do today is just kind of basically kind of walk you guys through the software, show you what it is, how it works, and whatnot. Uh, I don't have any like 100% uh, set agenda, right? So if people have questions as I go, feel free to ask them and then we'll just kind of, we'll, we'll go whatever direction, you know, the, the, the conversation goes, right? So how many people, yeah? So when you say 3D printer, do you mean a specific one or generically 3D printers? So generically, so uh, in the same way that Android can run on, you know, most uh, uh, phone models that are out there, obviously not all, uh, it is our goal to run on nearly all 3D printers. At the moment, we're compatible with uh, 3D printers that run Marlin and Sailfish firmware, which uh, is about 80 to 85 percent of the desktop 3D printer market. Now, once you get into industrial machines, they all have proprietary firmware stacks where we, the only way we can be compatible is, for, is with partnering with the companies. But sub $5,000 machines, about 80% on the market we're currently compatible with. Right. And, uh, and, and if people have, have uh, questions or interests around the actual business side, I'm happy to talk about it, but uh, we can white label our software as well. So for example, Airwolf 3D printers up in uh, Orange County, uh, they ship 3D printers with Wolfware software, which is a white label, well actually it's co-branded version of our software, right? So we power their Wolfware. And then we're talking with a lot of other 3D printer manufacturers about coming on as their standard software stack for them as well. Does that answer it? All right, good. So let's just start with, um, let me start with the side of our software that uh, operates the 3D printers themselves, right? So uh, again, as I mentioned, the, the goal of our, oh, uh, how many people in here have used uh, a 3D printer before? Okay, great, great. Uh, how many people have used a 3D printer like more than, let's say, 10 times? Okay, okay, good. So some of this might be a little boring for you guys, but it might be, might be interesting for others here, right? So um, uh, in general, most 3D printers, when you, uh, uh, and I'm talking, when I say 3D printers in here, I'm mostly talking about sub $5,000 3D printers, desktop printers, right? You pull them out of the box. Uh, many of them do not come with their own software. The, the company you bought it from tells you to go download this, uh, some, some free open source software stacks to, to run the machine, right? Or they might send it on a USB stick or something, right? Uh, some common ones would be Cura, uh, 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 Repeater Host, uh, Proner Face, Slicer. You guys may have, may have heard of some of these, right? Uh, now, what we saw as a problem in the industry is most of those software stacks are made by engineers for engineers, which is great if you're an engineer, right? Uh, but as these printer manufacturers are starting to move into uh, selling these printers to people that are not engineers, it might be small business owners, they, as we go a little further, it could be actual consumer users, right, in the home, right? That software was way too complicated. There's literally over 135 different settings uh, for each print to deal with, right? First layer perimeter speeds and thing, things like that that an end user shouldn't have to know about unless they're extremely advanced, right? So we wanted to make the software really, really simple. Now, one of the first problems that we faced is 
okay, we're starting to make software that can operate these machines, but what if the machines don't actually have the processing power or Wi-Fi capabilities uh, that we need them to have to run our software? So the first thing that we did is we actually uh, created a small hardware piece that we call the Astro Box, right? And all that's in here is a, um, a Linux board. This one actually runs a board called a PC Duino, uh, pretty similar to a Raspberry Pi 2, right? And our software can run on a Raspberry Pi as well, right? But for this box at the time, we chose to use a PC Duino board. Uh, all that's in there is that board in a nice case with our software on it. Uh, we ran a Kickstarter. Uh, this was last summer that, that did well. We were looking for 10 grand, we hit 40, right? Uh, we had about 400 backers, so people, uh, we kind of validated. People really wanted more advanced software for their machines, and they're willing to buy an accessory to actually upgrade that, that machine, right? So that kind of got us into, uh, or got us through the, the problem that you kind of started to point out before, right? There's all these machines out there, well, can we design it for every single one? Well, 80% of the machines uh, out there, they could just have one of these boxes, plug it into the machine, and then they can use our software. And again, because we're so tied into to the maker community, and that's not our primary business model, our software is also available for Raspberry Pi, and a lot of people out there are not buying our boxes, they're just getting a Raspberry Pi and throwing our software on there uh, for, for free. I mean, we still have to buy the Pi, right? Uh, and, and we're all good with that, right? We're not, we don't try to push them to, to, to buy stuff from us. Again, we're a software company. We actually are not focused on the hardware, right? So, it, it runs on the original Raspberry Pi. That's what I'm like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's it runs not, on, yeah. yeah. You don't need, well, you can't get the old one now. But if you have an old one that you're not using, this is a perfect app. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So it does run on the old Pi. So interestingly enough, uh, when we were setting up the, the Kickstarter, we are trying to figure out what to do, the, the Pi 2 had not come out yet, right? Uh, it had not, I hadn't even seen announcements for it. So we picked the PC, twi uh, PC Duino V2 board because it was way more advanced than the Pi, right? But quite honestly, the, the Pi 2 does pretty much everything this thing does, right? And I mean, don't, not that anybody is going to tweet this, but uh, we'll, we'll probably start moving away from this board, right? Because now it's, it doesn't make sense to support multiple boards when the Pi is just as functional and technically it is more stable because it's from a larger organization than this one, right? So, yeah, so you can run it on the old Pi or the new Pi, right? So, good. Uh, so then all someone has to do uh, is assuming their 3D printer runs Marlin or Sailfish, which is, is again, uh, about 80 85% of the ones on the market. They could take this board or, or the, the Pi box, whatever you want to call it. They simply plug the power into it, right? Plug it straight into the machine, and then uh, pretty much good to go, right? Yep. Could you run it off of a PC somewhere instead of having a separate hardware thing? Uh, right now, we don't have a PC version of it, uh, and I'm not. The, I'm not the coder guy to, to know enough about how what you would have to do if you could wrap it in something. It runs on Linux, right? So if you got something that could run Linux, it can. It is can, that a maybe? It's just every PC. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. It anyway. It seems to me like you you design the stuff or you download the stuff from a PC. So why not get rid of the middle thing? Because that way you can take your PC and walk around. Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. My PC is in my office. Or you could get another processor on your phone or something. You could take all that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's go through like the, the the process and use case, right? So, basically, what happens once this powers up, it creates a hotspot. So, for the first time you use it, um, for example, this will bring up a hotspot called AstroBox, right? You could use a phone, you could use a tablet, you could use a PC, right? And you connect to that AstroBox hotspot. Uh, and then there's a little wizard for setup. This one's already been set up, so I, I can't really show the wizard. Uh, and then you can also uh, go in. Part of the setup will be to come in and tell that box how to connect to uh, you know, your local network and whatnot. Right? 
So then what happens then is you can connect to that box locally through the hotspot if you don't want to go online, right, if you have security issues and whatnot. Or now there's the ability to connect to it straight through the internet and for added functionality, right? And we'll go through what some of that functionality is uh, here, here in a little bit, right? So you can see on here, this one is running a hotspot and uh, connected online. So uh, part of that allows us to do over-the-air software updates, right? So the end user doesn't have to know anything about Linux, even if they're running it on a Pi, right? Uh, when they need to update, they hit a button or two, it updates itself, right? And uh, again, they don't, they don't even have to know what Linux is, right? So again, uh, I'm showing this on this little computer. Just keep in mind, this computer is not plugged into this printer or the box. I could demonstrate all of this on my phone or on a tablet as well, because this is all done through uh, uh, Wi-Fi connections, right? Which then frees up your PC, and your PC doesn't have to be plugged into the computer, I mean, plugged into the printer the whole time. By the way, one of the uh, big complaints that we got from people that they wanted solved was exactly that. Number one, they didn't want their computer tethered to the printer for 10, 15 hours at a time. Number two, people get so many failed prints from Windows doing an automatic update, right? Yeah, see, you're laughing. You, you know that one happens, right? An automatic update or some other Windows-related issue, uh, power, something happens with the, the power and the print fails. All of that stuff goes away now. Right. So it is pretty intense process. I, I don't but, know too much about 3D printers, so I was guessing that there was some intermediate software taking place with, say, the, the printer bot. You know, yeah. There's not a lot of heavy processing, but um, it, it's just you know, other things come up that do suck up a lot more power, and that'll eat your battery away if you're using your laptop. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I mean is more like power goes out, it wasn't plugged in, something happens. I mean, well, if it's a desktop, obviously, it's going to be plugged in, right? Power surge, some, something like that, right? Uh, your, your print's going to fail, right? It's going to stop. So. <laughs> Trust me, it happens that way, right? Okay. What's that? <laughs> well, people, people complain about it. And the, yeah, there I are so many capable maker people working with 3D printers, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, that's us. That's what we're doing. <laughs> that's what this is, right? right. So we we solved the problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you say so. Maybe uh, I should. Do you think that we didn't solve I, the problem? I don't know. I don't understand. I'm, like, I'm working with too much data. It's, it's yeah, okay. Well, let, let's just keep going through the demo and we'll come back, right? Okay, because we actually haven't gone through much demo, right? All, all I've done is talk so far, right? Uh, so basically, uh, once the box is going, or uh, if it's a, a party that we're working with, like Airwolf and their Wolfware, which is actually embedded in the printer itself, right? Once you log into the printer or you log into the box, right? You're gonna get, th this is our basic uh, kind of app control screen for the printer itself, right? So uh, we'll kind of go through a couple of these apps so I can show you guys uh, uh, what they are, what they do, right? So there's a, a file manager app. And this, this one's a little boring, right? It, it, oh, yeah, thanks. It kind of does what you would ex expect a file manager to do, right? Uh, I can see files in here that I have locally saved on the box or on the printer. Uh, and these are all G codes uh, in this case. Um, I can also see what I have in my AstroPrint Cloud account. And, and again, you can think of this as uh, kind of like if you uh, have an MP3 player that can sync with iTunes. All of these boxes, or all of the AstroPrint connected printers can sync with AstroPrint.com for added functionality. And that, when I get to the cloud site and showing you guys the app store, I'll show you how we have these apps on the cloud that can all interact with, with the printer and what that's all about, right? Uh, and of course, we, we do uh, have uh, people using our system that are very security conscious and don't want to use the cloud portion, and that's fine, right? You, you don't have to uh, log this into the cloud, right? Uh, so if I wanted to print a file that is uh, in the cloud, I would just, I could just download it and hit print. 
these that I have on this box were not sliced for this particular uh, printer or not uh, this material. So we'll come back to actually initiating a print. We'll have to get a slice going. Right? I can sync my files here as well. Right? Uh, if I need to refresh there. Control screen. For you guys that have used things like Proner Face and Replicator G and all these other things, uh, it probably made your eyes bleed to go through those control screens, right? And again, like uh, as printer manufacturers try to make these things more user friendly, uh, that just doesn't fly, right? It's hard for them to sell machines to those folks, right? So uh, again, the idea here is all of this can be done from uh, a phone uh, or a tablet. So the idea is instead of putting touch screens on these printers, right? You, you have an incredibly advanced touch screen in your pocket, right? Or a tablet that you have running around. That becomes your touch screen for basically any 3D printer that you have around, right? And of course, if you want it dedicated, you can mount it on there if you want to, that's fine, right? Um, but that was our ori original premise. These things need touch screen controllers. Printer manufacturers don't want to spend a ton of money installing all of those things, right? So there are ways that they can add touch screen functionality without having to uh, uh, spend a lot of money on that, right? So of course, you know, all the functionality that you would expect on here, I can check the temperature, I can change temperatures, right? Well, that'll take it a little bit to start going down. This one doesn't have a heated bed, uh, right? You know, extrusion and whatnot. We'll get a print is, going is here. Is this your bit. printer? Uh, we don't make the printer, but, but I mean, we own okay. this one. Okay. Yeah, the, uh, the company that makes this printer is called PrinterBot. Um, so they, it, it's so small is the reason that we that we use it for demos. It's like a five or six hundred dollar okay. uh, printer and uh, pretty pretty decent quality for for the price, right? A uh, number of these things over here, like like Barnsworth here, was printed on that guy, right? So for for a five or six hundred dollar printer, you can actually make some some decent things with it. I think if you get the kit, it's like three hundred. Is it is it that cheap? And so and you were saying that uh, I think it's Lulz Bot has an even cheaper one now. I for think maybe? so. I'll check on that yeah. though. Yep. Yeah, the printers are getting like crazy cheap these days, right? Crazy. Or if you're willing, to. resolution and quality. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. But but yeah. But for different purposes, right? Yeah. Like yeah. a lot of those for people having their first foray into playing with Ooh. printers and yeah, yeah, for sure, right. Like XYZ's three hundred and fifty dollar printer that's coming out is is definitely not for engineers to make parts, right? So, yeah. I have a question. Uh -huh. What's the zero point one, the one, the ten, the hundred? Right. Yeah. So now this uh, we can probably clear this up on the UI a little bit. Uh, this is for um, how far it's going to move each time. So uh, so for example, right now it's going to move like ten units every time. Oops. Not used to PC water, but it's going to move like 10 units every time I hit this if I wanted to move just one. Right? If, and really, if you're doing some calibrations and whatnot, uh, you, you might need that. Or you're, if you're trying to, on this little printer bot, there's almost no reason to, to do big movements. Right? And honestly, part of the feedback we've had from people using the system, especially manufacturers, is that even though this printer control screen is significantly uh, cleaner than what's in other software stacks. Uh, some people have emphasized that we could actually make it even more clean, turn this into an advanced control screen, and get rid of all of that. And we'll probably soon have a simple control screen that's basically home, preheat for ABS, preheat for PLA, and maybe another button. And that'll be the control screen, and this will turn into an advanced control screen. What's okay. filament amount? 10 millimeters? Uh, yeah, so for extruding, uh, so for, well, let me, I, oh, 185 will still work. So, yeah, so if I'm trying to prime it and I need to run some filament through, oh, right? Yeah. Okay. So then, right, right now it's at 10 millimeters for every time I hit extrude, right? And I'll yeah. run that okay. through, right? And, and if I needed to retract for, for some reason, uh, then I could do that right there. And as, as we go on, we'll be uh, releasing more customized control screens for different printer manufacturers, because some of them have some very specific needs uh, with buttons that other machines don't need. 
Right. So, so speaking of calibration, mm -hmm. do you have any built-in calibration capability? So now the calibration would be uh, printer specific. Right. Right. So in that sense, our software here doesn't do specific calibrations, but now our slicing uh, engine, when I get to that, and that's on the cloud side, uh, for many of the printers, uh, we'll uh, put in the manufacturer recommended um, start and end G codes. Are you familiar with start and end G code? Or uh, which uh, many of them put their calibration G code in that. So then it would calibrate uh, before each print if it's uh, auto calibrated. Right. So th again, that, that has to be done on a on a printer printer uh, uh, specific. Set up right. Uh, let's see settings. I kind of showed you guys really quick. Like I can see I'm connected to a printer, right? Baud rate that it's on. Printer profile. This is set up for Marlin firmware by default. Uh, and, and in the little setup wizard, it would have, would have asked that, right? And I could let it know. Number of extruders. One on this guy. Max nozzle temperature. Max bed temperature. Interestingly enough, we actually had this even more simple. And then we're working with a company that makes a chocolate 3D printer. And they were mortified at the idea that someone could accidentally run the temperature all the way up to 280 degrees because it would completely destroy their machine, right? So then we, we had to start adding things in for where they could set a, a max uh, in the system, right? And then the user couldn't accidentally run that temperature slider up to, to something that would destroy their machine. Uh, let's see, internet connection and software updates, I kind of showed you guys before. Okay. Now, this is modular, so we're starting to add more applications to this as, as uh, need comes up and, and people ask for it. We never, we thought it would be too complicated in the beginning to have something like a G-code terminal in here, and it turns out a lot of people wanted a G-code terminal, right? So, so we added that, right? So. Right now, uh, we do have a G-code terminal. It's for really advanced users, and it's if you want to send G-code commands and you know what those are, right, directly to the printer where you just type them in and send them to the machine. Now, for people that aren't familiar with that, again, it's typically an advanced uh, use case, often for debugging and testing the machines, right? If for some reason it's not heating up right, and you're not sure if it's the software or the machine or whatnot, you could come here, send the exact heating commands that you want uh, without having to go through the other parts of our software to do it. Uh, also, certain machines, like, like this printer bot, sometimes for calibration, you actually have to do it through a G-code terminal, and that's printer bot's issue, right? There's nothing we can do about that, right? That's how printer bot does some of their calibration. They tell you to go send these exact cheat codes to it. So, so that's here, but what's more important is that our system is modular, and uh, we'll be adding more and more functionality right here as we move on. Right. So some things that you'll start to see on here before too long will be uh, printer-specific uh, apps, like uh, one printer company we're talking to needs um, some commands for one of their models, but not for other models in the system. Right, so they, they have a special auto feed and auto retract command. So then we'll have a special app for them that'll only show up on their machines, of course. And then uh, we're starting to talk with companies uh, that want to have direct content, like on machines. So for example, you know, uh, chatting with Hasbro and, and people like that, uh, that could actually have uh, apps and content that basically comes with AstroPrint on the machine, people could delete it if they don't want it, or they could choose to add it if, if we, you know, we're still working out the details on, on how that's going to work out, right? But it'll be, it, uh, we want an open modular system. We're not going to like force people to take certain content, right? They can add and remove as, as they wish, right? So if a venture company or somebody wanted to develop um, their own module, mm -hmm. um, do you publish AT? APIs and how to do that? Yeah, so so uh, we are building out those APIs on uh, use case uh, basis. So they're not public at this point. They're, they're not finished enough to be uh, public. So at this point, 
if they want to do like some deep integration, we kind of need them to work with us so we can develop it out uh, based on what they need. And then as we move forward, we'll, uh, we'll put those out publicly. But yeah, we are building it with that specifically in mind. The software I've shown so far that, that runs on this box, not the cloud, but this side, is open source. It is a fork of Octoprint. If people are familiar with, with Octoprint, uh, so Octoprint is a fork of Cura. So, so if people don't know open source and forking, right? So open source software, Cura was, is made by, uh, mostly by Ultimaker and Ultimaker people. Uh, Octoprint basically forked that off, which means Octoprint has to use all the licensing. Uh, legally, they have to use the licensing that Cura uses, so they have to keep it open source no matter what. We forked off of Octoprint which means we're in the exact same boat, right? So our software is definitely, uh, this software is definitely open source. It is currently only about 20 to 25% Octoprint code because we've, we've built so much on top of Octoprint. So at this point, we've deviated so far away from Octoprint, we don't consider it a fork anymore because there's no way that we could like actually pull Octoprint updates into our software stack. Right, so if you're looking around and like, yeah, we, we started as a fork, but we don't really talk about it like that much anymore because it's not, it, it's so different that, that we, we, we can't, we can't really, get it. but, but the, those are the roots of this software stack, right? So it's open source, a printer manufacturer or anyone could uh, pull the files up GitHub and make any modifications that, that they want to it. We'd encourage it, right? That's happy to have that happen. Now what's happening from a business point of view, and again, I don't know how much people are interested in the business side, um, is for a printer, it's di very difficult for a printer manufacturer to do that uh, because then as we, if they pull it off GitHub and they create their own software variant, right? As we release uh, bug fixes and we start making additions to the system, uh, their software is gonna deviate from ours and then they're gonna eventually need to pay an entire software team to manage that software stack. Whereas if they don't deviate uh, very far or they let us manage it for them, uh, then they never have to worry about that. They'll likely not have to hire a software team uh, to, to manage their software stack. But they're welcome to, right, uh, if, they want, if they want to go for it. And, and some are, and some aren't, right? And they're just going both directions, right? Uh, so, the, the side that runs, runs a printer, pretty simple, right? Uh, you don't need many more things than that in, in running the printer, right? So let me show you guys the cloud side, right? So now what, what I'm showing you now is what you see when you log in at astroprint.com. So what I've shown you before, it would all be accessed offline uh, uh, to directly connect with the printer, control the printer and whatnot. You don't have to be online to do any of that, right? Now what I'm showing you now is what we consider the uh, app store for the 3D printing industry, right? And, and a way that uh, you can connect through to your printer from the internet. So again, everything I'm showing you now could be accessed through a phone or tablet as well, um, really from anywhere, right? And there's, fun yeah, there's a lot of functionality for, for different, different use cases here. So we have a, a cloud-based file manager, right? Uh, so these are uh, files that I have in the cloud, uh, some of which I have created slices for. This is so one person in our office is really into printing the leaked TSA keys. So <laughs> that's what this is. Has, has anybody followed that story? Raise your hand if you know that, about the TSA keys. There are airport locks that the TSA requires, well, any lock that gets sent on a plane as a requirement that these TSC people need to be able to go through this. Yeah. They have standard locks, and there's a standard master key that opens any of these locks. Yep. And someone took a picture of one of these master keys, yep. and now anyone on the internet can print a copy of this key. Not just one, like or, I or believe any, all seven. Uh, well, seven of them. Yeah, because the guy in our office printed all seven. Okay. Yeah, just, just to play around with the keys and make sure it worked. So, it, so it's slightly off topic, but like, a really interesting thing that has to be talked about as 3D printing consumerizes. 
because we're in a world now where someone can post a picture online of someone holding a key that's in a high resolution, right? They don't even think about it. Keys down in their hand, but it's a 20 megapixel picture, right? Someone could zoom in from that 2D image, create a 3D uh, 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 STL of the key, well, you know, whatever of the key, and 3D print it, right? And that's been proven by this TSA picture. Picture of a guy holding these seven keys, leaked, that you could literally print them, they're on GitHub right now, right? And uh, so interesting conversations around security, right? Interesting conversations about what's gonna, you know, what, uh, what's gonna happen as we move forward and with uh, sec security of 3D files online, right? And if they need to be secured, if they don't, right? And I'm, I'm not taking a stance here, but these conversations definitely come out of that, right? So if you have a TSA lock, a lot of people use them on their luggage, right? Uh, so they can keep things locked as they go through the airport. That That is compromised. 100% chance your TSA lock is compromised. Right? That, that's so. neat for 3D printing, but people are also saying that the consequence of quantum computing mm -hmm. is that people will be able to overcome any encryption scheme that we're using right now. Man, to use quantum. Oh, bam, <laughs> look at this guy. Yeah. Are you familiar with that RM? No. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. I, I might need your services someday. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We all might. All right. All right, so so these are these are files in my system. Uh, so let me see if there's one that we've sliced multiple times. So this keychain I've sliced multiple times. So I can see the STL here. I can see once we sliced it for a printer bot, G code, once we sliced it for our creator pro which actually exports as, a, as a X3G, because uh, it's sailfish for people that are pretty technical. But I can, I can look at the metadata here, how long it's gonna take to print that, number of layers, right? And we can come back and, uh, uh, so, well, let me show you guys um, how our uh, Cloud Slicer works, right? So if I wanted to do another print of this, hit create print file, and this brings up our uh, slicing screen, right? So we try to make it super, super, super simple uh, and where almost anybody can, can do this, right? So all I have to do is choose my printer, printer bot simple metal. I need to choose my material. I actually, there we go. Oops, I missed the button. PLA, right? And then draft normal or best. Uh, quality, we'll just leave it at normal. And then I'm gonna hit print here in a second. But uh, for people that are advanced users, right, you're probably thinking, well, you know, I wanna get to first layer perimeter speeds. I want to change uh, temperatures in different ways. There is an advanced settings area where you can actually get to all of the other slicer settings that you need. We just kinda, we, we hide it on purpose because it scares the hell out of beginner users to see all of these settings, right? Now, the settings that we use when, when I do go to, to slice this, ah, man, I'm not used to a PC here. Uh, the, the settings that are, that are gonna be used are the manufacturer uh, recommended settings. So we have a back end where the manufacturers can actually log in and they can select uh, for everyone that's using their printer out there by default, they will have, they, they can choose which slicing engine they want them to have, whether that's Cura or Slicer with the three. And by the way, in the future, we can add other slicing engines, such as the Autodesk Slicer or any other open slicing, slicing engine in there. So it will, they can set by default the slicing engine and all of the, the slicing settings so the end user actually doesn't even have to know what a slicer is and what slicing settings are. Now, if the manufacturer goes in there and changes those, keep in mind this is a cloud platform, so it's changed for all of their users. Their users never need to update settings. Uh, they, never, they, they never have to download new software, uh, nothing like that, right? So for example, if PrinterBot released special settings for 
a ninja flex, which is like a flexible material, then uh, this could be put right in the system. The end user never has to know anything about that. They would just choose ninja flex and then go to print. Now again, people that use 3D printers know you're still in an era where you may need to tweak it, right? You know, and as you get more advanced, you need to tweak it, and that's what that advanced section is for, right? But most most people, uh, it's fine, is it right? The different there. filament sizes, like where you got 1.5 or whatever, two millimeter, that choice there. Yes, yeah. So actually, if I go to add material, and let me go to create a cust uh, create a custom material, right? I would name it filament diameter extruder temperature, uh, and that's that's uh, pretty standard there. Uh, for adding a printer, now what you can do for adding a printer is you either choose one from the list we have here, and then you're going to get the manufacturer uh, defaults. You can also create a custom. Oh, it's, it's not used to this guy. Create a custom one, in which which case then. You've got to put in a number of things like is it a round print bed, is it rectangular, the size, nozzle diameter. Um, if you need start and end G-code commands, these are all things that uh, we don't think end users should have to know about. That's why we we have the presets, right? Yeah, for me, when, when I mess around with my slicer, sometimes you know, like really you want it to go like after it, it dispenses a little bit. And then you have it go touch off by a brush or something to kind of get off that residual plastic before you find it. You know what I'm saying? Something like yeah. that. It might be nice to have a feature like that. Wait, I'm and sorry. Could, could could you repeat that? Just at that point, at that portion, you know, it's kind of it's a really cool tool. It's kind of it's tricky to edit the the pre and the post elements yeah. of a slicing ele uh, engine. So the pre will have some kind of operation that the printer could do right. before it actually starts printing, like extruding so much and right. then go and wipe or something. And even in the post, in the post you may want to have the the it go up like a couple millimeters yep. above the part and then move over right. you know to home or whatever and then yep. move out or something. Yep. Turn the fan off. Turn the heat bed off. Turn, you know. Right. They might do that. I don't know. It right, right. And that's exactly what that is, right? So so you you um if you choose a printer that's already in the system, you'll get the manufacturer suggested certain NG code, but you can modify that, right? Or if you put in the custom one, it's, it's blank. And then, I mean, which it, it should, for most printers, will still operate fine, right? But then you can put in whatever certain NG code. So you code guys can have like a want. little interface where it's just intuitive, just to enter that. Because I mean, then, it, then you have to like modify the G code, which is kind of tedious. You know, <laughs> you don't ever no, mess with the Oh, no, it happens at the slicing level. Uh -oh. Right? Yeah, yeah. So the slicer puts uh, the start and end G code into the yeah, G code yeah. Yeah. file. Yeah. So so then you don't you don't have to have to deal with. And that. that's only going to be determined uh, a set by the manufacturer. You're not. Are you, so I'm just curious. And you can have a feature where you can customize. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. You yeah. can customize it right now. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. No problem. So even if you choose one of those manufacturers that has it preset, uh -huh. you can modify that. Yeah, for sure. Do you have any provision for, uh, I call it a confidence monitor, knowing if I if I think I'm printing in white, how okay. do I know that I'm using the white filament? So not right now. So we can... But that's more printer feedback yeah. to your yeah. box. So as be, being a, a software layer, as soon as the hardware manufacturers get sensors on their machines that can do that, we can add the functionality on the software side. Right? Um, or a camera. Looking at the spool, uh, you slightly ahead of me. Right? We'll, we'll get oh, there. Oh, we, okay. We've got we've got camera functionality, oh. right? So, so I'll get there. Uh, so here I hit. Uh, if if I hit slice, it's just going to slice it. It's going to put it in my uh, in my uh, uh, file manager. If I hit print, it brings up and it lets me know. Okay, I've got three these three printers or these three in this case boxes all connected to my AstroPrint account, right? And I can choose which one which one I want to print to, right? Uh, I happen to know, I mean, normally you would probably name these, my printer bot, right, or my whatever. I, I use these for, for all sorts of things. So this is AstroBox Drew. So I'm going to hit print now, right? So it's slicing in the cloud. 
Again, all this could be done on a phone or tablet. The slicing isn't happening on the computer. Right? It's happening on Amazon Web uh, Services, uh, I guess, printers, right? To go to monitor now, I don't have a camera connected to this right now, obviously, but I could. And if I did, I would have the ability to take, take pictures of it. And again, if I started that remotely, uh, there's more value. I can show you. And then hit a cancel if it's. Absolutely. Uh, if a goober is coming out, then, then it's not going to be successful. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is one that's actually in our office downtown, right? So, I mean, that, that's a live picture of our 3D printer in our office downtown. And uh, I mean, I could even sort of print on that from here if I wanted to and cancel it if, if there was a problem. Right? Uh, so again, I just don't have a camera hooked up to this guy, but it's bringing it. So I need to get that thing on. Well, let's see, it might work. So, and hopefully it sticks. Oh! <laughs> yeah, let's... Alright. have the camera take a picture of the Yeah, let's gonna... see. Yeah, I think this guy... I think... There we go. Yeah, it might make it. I can get that one... If you're calling it Goober off of there, probably make it. Well, we'll let it run and see what happens. Okay. So, I have a question. Yep. Um, if I have a printer farm of 15 to 20 yeah. printers, I can control it from one yes. PC. Yeah. And, uh, and, and if I have cameras on them, I can watch each and every one. Yeah, and that's what a number of people do, and that's this monitor app. Okay. Right? So, for example, Airwolf runs about 20, they run a printer farm and print a lot of parts for their own machines. They run a printer farm of 15 to 20 machines. They use one tablet that, oh, what comes up there? It should be coming up. There we go. One tablet that uh, shows every machine they have connected online right there. Uh, if uh, the camera was on this instead of uh, this um, rendered image. I mean, you can see a small image right there. You can see what's printing, what's not. Uh, they just walk right through their printer farm and use one tablet to restart, you know, clear up the print bed, start, start the next print right there. They don't have to go back and forth to a central computer. They don't worry about power. Something, someone kicks a plug out on that computer and then all 20 printers have a problem, right? You know, nothing. Right. In the case of Airwolf, uh -huh. since they have your, your software in the printer, mm -hmm. they can do that. But if you had a different printer, like if I had a bunch of roll of 3Ds, mm -hmm. will one of your AstroPrint boxes support multiple, or do I need an AstroPrint box for each printer? You need a box for each printer. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and especially you know if you're running with a Pi. Right, right. No, 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 you no. need a pie on each printer. Right. Yeah, That's what yeah. I like I like your attitude. It's cheap. Do it. There's other people that are they're like thirty five dollars. I can't can't do it. Right. So yeah, yeah. You buy a three D printer, you generally have enough. <laughs> yeah, but it's exactly. difficult by printing five thousand parts for an order off of one machine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what's thirty five bucks when you've got an order? For Five thousand well, parts. I, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. Nothing. Yeah. Well, it's more like because you need a Wi-Fi, you need a USB. Power. <laughs> All right. Let's. Fifth let's. Bucks. I got. I got a couple more things to, to get through here. So let's. Let, let's. Uh, let's. Let's keep going here. We'll come back. But. But so generally, so that that's the monitor app, right? We might as well do that, right? So I can see all the printers I have uh, connected online, no matter where they are. Uh, I can get an idea of what's going on with them. If they're printing, uh, I can come here. I can monitor it again. This could be on my phone, right? Uh, I can pause the print. I can cancel the print. Uh, we'll probably remove the ability to change temperature. We realize now that's just super advanced to be like remote and 
look at it and decide you want to change the temperature five degrees. But for now, you, you could change the temperature even remotely uh, if you wanted to. Um, if you have 4K resolution, then you can... What's that? If you have a 4K camera on it, it'd be fine. Yeah. And yeah. You can tell if it was, like, warping and you needed to increase temperature. Yeah, and that was our thought process. It'd really be more for if the camera's on it. And, or, or you might notice it's, too, it's stringier than you want it to be or something. Yeah. Uh, but then we all, yeah, we just realized, like, it turns out not a lot of people are changing the temp after it gets going. And um, and also, if our goal is to make it so simple anybody could do it, we're, we would start considering that a really advanced feature, which we might then have an advanced tab or something that and kind of keep it a little bit hidden for, for the beginning level user. Because let's face it, most beginning level users, if they try to change the temperature, they're going to screw something up, as opposed to fix something, right? And that's that's kind of our thing. So, uh, and then for for the machines that are, or for the boxes that are out there, not printing something. I mean, we could come here. Well, let me go. Let me go to the one that uh, is actually hooked up to a printer, right? So this uh, this one's actually hooked up to a printer, right? And as I mentioned. I can see the temperature, it's off, right? That's, that's, that's the, the room temperature, most likely there, right? I can check up on it. Um, I can log out of it, like if, if I need someone else. So, so there is security on this, right? Uh, I'm logged into that printer, if someone else in the office needed to use it, I don't wanna give my password, I could log out of it, and then they could go log into it, right? Uh, you can also leave it like uh, uh, unprotected if you wanted to. Uh, so let me show you guys a couple more apps that we have on here. So Thingiverse, how many people know Thingiverse? Right, okay, yeah. So Thingiverse, a couple hundred thousand or so. They don't even publish numbers anymore, right? But probably a couple hundred thousand models. Uh, arguably 30% or so are 3D printable, right? If you, if you know a lot about 3D printing, you know how to weed through the ones that aren't, but a lot of people don't know how to do that, right? But anyway, uh, come in here, now this isn't, keep in mind for people that have used Thingiverse, this is a Thingiverse app on AstroPrint, right? So without going to, to, to Thingiverse.com, right from a phone or tablet, right? Come through, search, find a model uh, that you like, right? Oh, this one's on Adafruit, uh, for friends with those guys. I could download the model, I could add it to AstroPrint, I could even just initiate the print process right here. Which what it, what it just did, it just imported that model from thingiverse.com into my astroprint.com account, right? And it will start the slicing screen where then I simply choose my settings, choose the printer, hit a button, and it starts, right? So printing, again, like straight from the internet directly to the printer, right? Uh, I'm not going to start it, uh, but you guys get the, get the idea, right, of, of what I do. Are these pre-screened though, or are you just you know something that's just going to be like? Yeah, it's not pre-screened, so we consider it just a general Thingiverse app uh, for anything on Thingiverse. Sometimes you know they have a model you know on the surface. Yeah. That happens a lot on Thingiverse. The original idea for our company was not AstroPrint. the The original idea. Uh, Raise your hand if you've heard of 3D Agogo before. What? Nobody's heard of our original idea. But it wasn't 3D Agogo something like if you would give, people would give you the model. So 3D Agogo is basically I stock photo for 3D printing, right? Uh, so then these are models that designers put on there. They can put them on for free or they could charge uh, uh, for a personal business or commercial license. Uh, it's up. It's up to them. We don't control it now. Now, how we were different is um, we did curate that everything on here must be printable, like saved in the correct orientation, and it has been printed on a 3D printer before, right? Now, um, so what what we were trying to do was basically solve the problem of beginners going to Thingiverse and finding something that looked cool but it was saved in the wrong orientation, or it was actually just not printable, right? And uh, they didn't know, and they get failed prints and get frustrated with 3D printing, 
right? So this was the, the original thing that we started with. And 3D Gogo is still active. Uh, it's just not our primary business focus right now, right? Um, yeah, so the, we wanted to solve that problem. Do you, do you think that that's a viable approach to put up models and then sell a license? I mean, are people going to be making money doing that? No, yeah. they're not. Uh, yeah, so so basically, and we know other people in the industry, friends that have other sites that sell models, and uh, very few people are buying 3D printable models. So people love free ones, right? So so 3D a go go. Basically, what happened with that it, as a business is uh, it was fairly active. People download uh, free models all the time. Our uh, user base keeps going up even to this day even though we're putting no marketing or focus on it, right? Um, but very few paid per, uh, or per actual purchases. And the way we view this, and a lot of other people view this in the market is, I mean, of course, 3D printing still is more hobbyist than it is consumer, right? It's not, they're in a 3D printer in every home, right? So in general, hobbyist, uh, hobbyist value money more than time, right? Uh, and what that means is a hobbyist would rather spend 10 hours doing something themselves than spending one or two bucks on it. Uh, not necessarily because they're cheap, because th it might be because they love doing it themselves. Right. Yeah, absolutely, right? But so then they value money more than time. They'll, they'll spend lots of time freely on something, uh, but, but money not as much. Once uh, we shift to a consumer market, and you know, whenever that happens, right? A year, ten years, right? I mean, I think it's gonna be soon, right? Some other people think more down the down the line. Consumers are the opposite, right? Non hobbyists, right? Uh, they value time more than money, and they would rather spend ten bucks on something than to spend an hour trying to read tech blogs to try to figure out how something works or how to do CAD themselves or something like that, right? So, so we still believe there is a place for that business, but it's not a scalable business that can support owners of a company right now. It seems like right. Pinoco does this. Do you, if you submit a request that hasn't been made, then they, they ask you if you'd be willing to offer to sell the design to your site. Ah, uh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. There, there is Shapeways. Yeah, Shapeways. I mean, they mainly sell 3D printed stuff. Right. right. They, they manufacture. They sell the service of 3D printing. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I can those too, and they offer but also laser cutting. They do all yeah. sorts of stuff. Yeah. It's really neat because you can buy the materials. Like it's so much cheaper to go to Pinoco than um, the ride out plastics. Right. The ride out plastics not only sells a lot, you know, it's a lot of money for the acrylic, but they also charge a premium for laser cutting. It's amazing, Pinoco. I got some stuff laser cut. It's like cents on a dollar. I mean, you yeah, pay $25 nice. dollars for a piece of plastic and it's like 25 cents to cut it. Oh, wow. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Nice. Can you, can you spell that? <laughs> P-O-N-O-K-O. -O. Yeah, they've been around for a while. I think Chris Anderson's involved with Pinoco, right? I don't know that guy. Yeah. But, um, yeah, from 3D Robotics. Yeah. A, I think it was an uh, offshoot Spark Time. So, so they oh, kind of, oh, really? kind of collaborated. Okay. I, no, I think it's maybe different now, but it's really neat. And maybe in this case, similar thing where you have calibrated printers, where you like, for example, I'd love to have parts made in nylon. You know, right, right. What a headache for me yeah. to actually set up my extruder to print in nylon. Well, you know? what you can do with <laughs> with our system, and we'll be moving towards it more later, is uh, for files that you put in your yourself, like if it came from uh, a third party, we, we block certain functionality to, to allow them to protect uh, their files. But if you up, up, upload it yourself or you design it yourself, you can also order a, a 3D print. And right now we're partnered with uh, iMaterialize uh, to do that. So then, I mean, you could order that in any material that you want. I, uh, they do metal, uh, oh, metal stuff, titanium, wood filaments, right? Uh, Full color, right? Uh, it just like shape waves, right? But but I materialize is just slightly different, right? So so we have some of that functionality in there, like 
you know, you, you can print it in some ways on your on your home printer, but if you need something more advanced, you could send it out. Uh, we don't currently support like the laser cutting and, and whatnot, though. Yeah, this is a neat idea you have, uh, because in theory, you, you could calibrate your printer mm -hmm. to work with a spe special materials. Yeah. And in theory, you could offer oh, yeah, the yeah. public access to print on your printer. Yeah, and, and we're moving towards that. So there's, um, again, like the big vision of our company is to be uh, a platform that third parties innovate on, right? So uh, a lot of the apps that I, I'm showing you guys are apps that we've created or we work with partners to create. As we move forward and all the APIs are public, the idea is we want third parties to make things that we don't have time to do or that, that we would never think of, right? And um, that that's one of the things that we are hoping a third party gets to, uh, and if they don't, we will. Now, uh, are you familiar with 3D Hubs? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where Right, well, with 3D Hubs, like you, you upload a, a model, and then they show you people that have 3D printers around you that will print it for you and at what price. And then so if you have a 3D printer, you can say, I will print anything in ABS for 25 cents per cubic centimeter. I'll take orders, right? And then uh, 3D Hubs kind of roots orders to local, just people that own 3D printers. You right? walk down the block and pick it up. Yeah, and, the, and that's what they push shift for. Them, so. And that's what they push for, people meeting at a coffee shop, and I'll yeah. give you your, your print. But how right? is that working now? I mean, is it they, kind they, of died they, out? Or they, they raised $4 million from Balderton Capital not too long ago. Oh, wow. Okay. So uh, so I think they're, they're cruising, right? Yeah. Yeah, so 3D Hubs is, is doing fine. I mean, I, I don't know what their profit loss stuff is, right? They'll probably have to raise another round and whatnot. They'll probably have a, a Series B later before they're profitable. But uh, but they're cruising, cruising along. Yeah. I've never met anyone in San Diego, but I, I did notice that there are people in the area that offer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but we would like to have 3D Hub, a 3D Hubs app on here. And then that solves the problem. We don't have to manage a whole community and the whole thing. They already have an infrastructure in place for the payment and the estimates and all of that and managing um, print queues in, in relation to delivery, right? And we can manage print queues as they're going straight to the printer. We would like to partner with them. They have a competitor, make XYZ, uh, right? We could have their app on here as well. Uh, uh, but we could also build it ourselves. But again, as a true platform, we don't we don't want to build every piece of software. We we, we want a community of people developing on here. Okay. So let's let's keep going here. So uh, Thingiverse is a, kind of a standard uh, content related app. CG Trader is another resource out there that has uh, I don't know twenty thousand plus three D printable models on their system. Some are for charge, some are not. It looks like their API may be having a little issue right now. Don't know why that's not loading up. Um, but uh, CG Trader, uh, similar uh, interface to Thingiverse, right? You go through, find a model from there, and print it. As we move forward, we're talking with other content repositories. Uh, my Mini Factory is one that'll be on here soon. I don't know if people know them. Uh, we just we're so busy, we've had to push push back uh, launching it. Uh, but but many more are coming. Uh, 3D Print Cloud is the first uh, paid app that a third party put on here. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with the company Materialize. They're a they're a public company that makes 3D printing software. Uh, they're based out of uh, the Netherlands, uh, but they're traded on New York Stock Exchange too, I think. But uh, they make software mostly for industrial 3D printers, but they're moving down into uh, consumer types of 3D printing. They've got a partnership with LeapFrog 3D printers and some others out there. But they've got a cloud-based uh, uh, model repair application right? that they've released not only for AstroPrint but for other people. right? Uh, so here, uh, this particular account, we don't have a, a trial going, but uh, uh, you could basically take any of your models you have in your AstroPrint cloud run it straight through the materialized 3D print cloud, it will repair uh, mesh issues and whatnot and send it right back into your account. Okay? Uh, and you know that's a lot of what their company does. Uh, they can also uh, 
change almost any file type into an STL, any, any obviously 3D model file type, right? So if you have some obscure thing or even SketchUp files and whatnot, you can send it through there. They'll turn it into an STL. They'll also uh, fix uh, mesh issues, and then you're, you're good to go, right? Right? Uh, any kind of alert when the print is done? What's that? Any kind of alert when the print is done? Yeah, actually, uh, an email alert, uh, which you can turn off. Uh, some people have asked for SMS alerts. We, we just haven't put it in. We, we've been too, too busy. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it's a good idea. We could put uh, like an on screen alert, it might be an SMS thing. So, yeah. Um, uh, if you do run a camera, uh, with your with your printer, uh, you can set this to uh, uh, you know you set it to take pictures uh, you know either every layer, every minute, every five minutes, whatever you want. You can set it to take those pictures. Those pictures are uh, saved here, right? Um, right. That was an object printing, so it just runs through a time lapse. Whoa. Um, whoa, am I shutting down something? You can shut it down. What, what, what's that? You can shut it down. What, oh, it's not going to shut down the computer? No. Okay. Okay. Right. Uh, I could share, I don't use PCs, right? So uh, I, could, I could hit a button and share this as a video straight on Facebook or YouTube if I wanted to. I could download it. Again, it's images right now, but we can automatically compile it into a video for you uh, if you wanted to, right? So we've got that in there. Um, printer profiles, material profiles, pretty straightforward. Uh, the other one that's interesting, our first uh, cloud-based CAD tool, uh, 3D Slash is a French company that makes a cloud-based CAD tool for kids with a Minecraft style interface. So you could import your AstroPrint models straight into here. If you import an AstroPrint model, it'll turn it into a series of cubes uh, for the kids. Uh, and then they could go through and a Minecraft style interface, uh, create whatever they whatever they want to create, right? And there's there, there's other tools that they can use, not just breaking things apart, right? What just about uh, OpenSCAD JS? You ever seen that? I mean, that'd be cool. For you. Yeah, so so again, it, it's third-party apps. We would love for people to build those in as apps, oh, but it's right? It's so easy, you just copy, you know, you just put the JavaScript in your web browser, your web server, and you can serve it. It's yeah. as, as easy as, it's so, it's so okay. easy. Yeah, you should check it out. Yeah. I think it'd be perfect for this. It'd take like an, an hour and you have it. There. Okay. Well, let me. Yeah, I'll I'll send something to our CTO. I've definitely seen it and used it a it's few not places exactly online. Like open scat, as you're right. some kind of nuanced differences, but it, okay. it's pretty cool. You, you know, it'll export into SDL. And, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and we could just link it. You could just pull files from your Azure Print Cloud, then modify them, save them back into the cloud, right? Or print straight from. Well, I think the thing. I, that would be more complicated. I think yeah. just creating. Well, I mean, that's the thing for, for our part. That part's easy, right? So. Yeah, just creating shapes yeah. using the, the OpenSCAD JS to be exported in STL. And you yeah. can save them as, as OpenSCAD files right, right. as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll run that by them. That, that is something we could probably get down there pretty easily. Well, right. I had three kids today in the library that ranted and raved about Minecraft and mm -hmm. being. Clueless about it, yeah. But had I known about this, those kids would have been all over using this, coordinating. Yeah, yeah. and then whatever they create in there, they can three D print, so and send send it to the machine even wirelessly if they're using the full system, right? And the idea is, as apps come on board, there's a couple different types of apps. Customizers are one, right? So there's another company, Leopoly, uh, that will be releasing an app for them soon. They have more advanced customizers that are still very easy to use, but it's not so Minecrafty where it's blocks, right? You can, it, it's more stuff like you can have a, a pendant and then you can add your name to it and and uh, change shapes of things and add add components, right? Just whatever uh, to keep the kids interested or get yeah. them interested. Yeah, 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 uh, absolutely. Um, 
What are you doing for time? We're, so we're pretty the, much there. What is the incentive for a company to host an app here? I mean, mm -hmm. do you pay them or what is the customer? No, we don't pay them. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, I, yeah so how does the business work? Yeah, so 70-30 uh, split in the same way that uh, Apple does with the Apple App Store and Google Play does. So the any type of sales that they create, whether that's a app purchase, in-app purchase, or subscription, it doesn't matter, then they keep 70% up, we keep 30, we pay the credit card fees and whatnot too. And so, so is it sort of like they sell, like they offer you a subscription or something and then you sign up or? or? Well, it, it's up to the third party, right? So for example, some are free, 3D Slash doesn't currently charge. At some point in time in the future they might, uh, but they, they don't currently. Uh, they're focused on doing like uh, a lot of stuff in education and trying to get schools to buy education like packs and whatnot. Uh, so they, they might add it in later. CG Trader charges for some models and some are free. So there'll be some charging there. Yegi is completely free. Um, 3D Print Cloud, now they're the, uh, they charge a monthly subscription. Uh, and they just started, right? So with, and there's a 30 day free trial. So no one has yet gotten past the 30 day free trial because it hasn't been live more than 30 days, right? So, uh, so we'll see. We'll see what the conversion to subscription is there. Um, Thingiverse, totally free. As we move forward, like, uh, keep in mind, just like the app store, like, there's a lot of value in free apps too, right? So uh, Disney could, could promote an upcoming movie with free prints of certain characters, right? They may not even want to charge for that. Maybe a printer. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? So there's a lot of apps that might be free as we go on, but then there's also a lot of possibilities of a Disney build your own lightsaber customizer that you can then 3D print and people will pay five, five bucks or more for uh, one of those, I'm sure, right? Uh, but again, to us as the platform, well, we want to have the ecosystem in place that allows all of these uh, various like vendors and developers to play around in the ecosystem, try things, see what's going to work, right? What will people pay for? What will people expect to be free, right? Where do they see value, right? Uh, and, and we're working on some other th uh, deals too. Uh, for example, uh, uh, let's just say a major uh, toy IP holders or someone that holds li uh, licenses for major characters that, that, that kids uh, use. We're working out ways that we can have their content on the, the embeddable side of our software and the printer manufacturers pay for it, right? Like, like there's no reason why a printer manufacturer uh, that's selling to consumer instead of industrial, right? They will sell more printers if they could put a My Little Pony on the printer box, right? And if we're managing the software and we have a deal with uh, the toy company, we can get we can get those My Little Ponies on the software, they can pay, they would happily pay for that, and the end user gets My Little Ponies, and they feel like it was free, really maybe there was an extra two or three bucks added to the price of the printer to, to get those My Little Pony designs, right? Um, I mean, in essence, it's free, right? That's generally how, how, how business works, right? So we're working through some deals like that as well. Uh, you know, as, as we talk with different groups. Like a scanning, 3D scanning would be pretty cool. Yeah, we're, we're, we're talking with uh, Microsoft right now. You know, they've got a scanning app coming out, right? So we're chatting with them about getting involved with that uh, as well. So, and, and there's a few others. Yeah. Uh, one thing, uh, I know we're, we're at the end of the time. I, I didn't have a chance to show you guys, but uh, or I'll just do it really quick. Like, why not? Nobody, only one person got up and left, so. <laughs> How many people have seen the NIH 3D Print Exchange? Okay, so this is pretty interesting. Uh, NIH National Institutes of Health, oh, wow. right? So they, they, they do have a 3D uh, print model section. Oh, am I blocking that? Sorry. Yeah. Where you can come through now, most of these things, if you know 3D printing, it would be a beast to try to print, like proteins and whatnot, right? But but you can also do things 
like looking up like hip bones, right? And this, this is largely for medical students, right? This is, this is not like bioprinting, right? This is like a medical student may want to print uh, uh, a hip that's fractured, right? To, to be able to feel and touch like a certain yeah, type of really hip cool. fracture, right? Imagine now if you could print, and this is what I want to do, I'll show you guys one here, is biological content in patterns. Yeah, they're already doing it. sourcing from different consumable vendors. So you oh, basically okay. have That's an exchange place where you can buy this antibody from this company or that oh, company gotcha. or that company. And you, like a yeah. Pinoco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some interesting things happening around that. We've, we've got one thing under NDA that's not, it's not exactly that, but a little bit similar uh, that's moving there. Because our software can, can operate uh, as bioprinters also, as some of them, right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's some things coming with that. Uh, and you can think of it as like, like the NIH, this is a public exchange. You basically just need a private ex exchange. Right for that, where only researchers have access to it, right? Uh, and, and something couldn't get out publicly, right? But for example, right now, with these models, if you uh, chose this model, right, from oral head and acetabular fossa repair, so you want to see what it looks like after a surgical repair, uh, you could print this out. Now, when you go to download it, you have the choice of downloading the STL. X3D file, which is not, which is different from X3G. If people want to learn about it afterwards, I can talk about it. Uh, or you can actually, right from the NIH's web page, initiate a print on AstroPrint. That's awesome. Right, and and uh, this this is um, uh, this is, right. So it is starting. It's already imported into my account. I can start to print. Uh, now that's just a simple line of code that any marketplace can add to their system. Right, the NIH adopted it first. We've got it on a few other small uh, websites, and then we're talking with some other big groups about adding it there as well. Right? So I, I just think that's pretty cool. And again, yeah, that can be done great. on a phone it's or tablet. It's amazing. It's, you've got such a great business model. It's so interesting. Um, it, you know, like I sell bioprinters. This is my oh. business. So, hey, so we should chat. Know, yeah, we should <laughs> chat. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, you know, like the example of different type of dispensing. Yeah. You know, yeah, you got PLA, you know, yeah. uh, extrusion process. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really so, cool. and, and we, we were recently chatting with a, uh, a company that does a pneumatic extrusion for bioprinting. And uh, do people know what that is? Do people care? Even though we're, we're at the end of the time. So, I, I'll tell you guys what, I think this is listed for 715. Is that right? When it ends? Yeah. So, I, I can keep talking about this stuff forever. <laughs> And I am, and I will. Uh, so if anybody gets to the point and, and you want to leave, you consider it done. I won't feel like it's rude or anything, right? Well, but I, I love talking I like about this. I'd like to hang out with you and talk yeah. a little bit. I mean, okay. I'd like to show you some of the stuff that I'm working on in terms yeah. of the bioprinting, and um, just to see if it resonates. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we work with uh, these piezo dispensers as well as mm -hmm. the pneumatic extrusion. And, mm -hmm getting better market exposure rather yeah. than going to a trade show. I just see this as being so powerful. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's really clever that you've done it, and it's really advanced. Yeah. I mean, like the fact that you just got this far with the NIH. I didn't even right. know that NIH doesn't even exist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we're, we're, we're already yeah, in, yeah, right? Yeah. We're already in, in with those guys. And we're moving towards some other governmental groups next, right? It's but, probably a failed trip with them. I didn't know that. Nope. Uh, no, no. The the slicing engine will add uh, support, support structures okay. to it, and, and again, our our slicing engine. If people know know about this, is slicer with the three and Cura. So, and we don't modify the actual slicing engine, only the interface around it. So you'll get the exact same output as if you ran this through Cura on your. A downloaded version of Cura that you're running independently or Slicer. So let me get, I mean, as I understand, I thought Slicer was just kind of some Sky and Forge, you know, generation next. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't add support structures. No, it, it does. Really? Oh, it will. I mean, yeah. you have to check a box saying add support structures and your overhang oh, wow. threshold. 
Now, slice, Slicer has evolved a lot. It's not like a raft. I mean, a raft... You can add a raft, too, yeah. with it. Yeah, okay, so it's separate. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. So you would just tell it, like, over overhang threshold is 65 degrees. Yeah. Like, like my printer can print up to 65 degrees without needing supports. Then it will go in, and anything that's more than 65 degrees, it'll add supports. Now, admittedly, it's not the best support structure engine oh, in the yeah. industry. Yeah. Like Simplify 3D and whatnot has significantly more advanced support structures, but it's also 150 bucks. I always just make so, them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I add on to it, import the STL, like an open SCAD, and mm -hmm. just <laughs> support structures. Yeah, just add a few Which in. Which are just yeah. basically yeah. cylinders with hollow cylinders. Yeah. And then you just cut them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you get a, three, a print preview with supports and raft shown? Not right now. That that's something we need to add. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Because yeah, um, I may, I mean, a support here when I want the support there. Yeah. And can you can't see your orientation? It's, it's all equals you want yourself. You guys are good at, at finding the holes, right? So not right now. That's that's like absolutely the number one most requested uh, feature. Uh, and as we're building things out, we just had to choose what was first and and, and right, what was going to wait. Uh, but a plating application where you can a C support structures and whatnot added, uh, like a G code viewer, right, is uh, is super important. And then also the ability to plate, uh, meaning add multiple STLs to a single plate, change orientation. That that will be coming. It, it, you it's can kind of do a little bit of that with the OpenSCAD JS. You can yeah. actually import STL uh, objects. Yeah. But not. I don't think they. I've when I've tried it, some are. Some will work, yeah. <laughs> not all. Right. You know, so I don't know something yeah. as complicated as this one. Yeah. So ultimately, we want it to be like, you know, one-click printing, right? So with us, we feel like the, the manufacturers will drive like a lot of that side of it, right? If a manufacturer wants a different slicing engine than what we have currently available, our system's modular. We just add it in right next to Slicer and Cura. Right, not, as long as it's legal, right? As long as we have a license to do so, right? Or if it's a proprietary one, we can do it just for them. Uh, I, I tell you, th this would be an interesting use case. And this is for industrial, but bio printing would follow a similar thing. Although most of our marketing and everything is focused towards kind of consumer use, the reality is our platform has lots of industrial medical applications. And we have a metal 3D printing company that's already approached us that I mean, they, they'll uh, they'll they'll be releasing their metal 3D printer next year. It's selling in the uh, 400 to 500 thousand dollar range to Boeing, right? Boeing and GE and companies like that. Um, now uh, they need their printers cloud cloud connected, cloud enabled. They don't want to, they don't want to manage all of that. They want to focus on advanced metal slicing software to make their machines print better. They don't want to deal with WebSocket connections and getting through networks and all this other stuff, right? So they're very interested in having their slicer in our cloud, but it's a proprietary slicing engine, right? So at one level, we can make it only for their machines. There has to be a business arrangement behind that, right? Because it's work for us. But they're also interested in taking their metal slicing engine for their type of technology and allowing their competitors to pay them to use that metal slicing engine through our cloud, right? So then it becomes a, a paid plugin that their competitors could even use, and then they're making money off of that, right? Um, and and bi bio, pretty pretty similar, I would assume, because there's, uh, I mean, different types of slicing. No, you, you're right sitting on something extremely valuable, in, like in terms of if you could get vendors in the area that make reagents to provide their materials there where you yep. can pick and choose and then have labs printing yep. to have those printers, then you're going to create a sustainability for scientists who run out of grants. Let's do it. You know, Let's I mean, do this. You know, that's the, the beauty of it. You're going to create yeah. science at yeah. a grassroots level, which is right now getting pummeled. Okay, people are just having a hard time getting funding. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. And so this is a wonderful thing. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's make it all happen.
we're, we're a little bit over yeah, time, yeah, so yeah. maybe if you can stick around a little bit yeah, to answer yeah, I'm any happy questions. To. And, and, if, and if somebody wants a keychain, uh, <laughs> go for it. We'll have to. I don't know if you, if you have like a scraper. I, I got it. Oh, wait. Here we go. Oh, no. It's not here. He's not a key. No, yeah, yeah, it's a little Astro Print keychain. That's a TSA key. It's not the TSA key. <laughs> no, 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 no. I did not print the TSA key. If we yes. can give a round of applause. Yeah. 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 Drew was also part of the Evo Nexus uh, incubating companies. Uh, yeah. they, they just did a demo yeah. uh, so from San Diego. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Everyone coming to Maker Fair this weekend? Yeah. That's the best day to go. I'm going to be there. No one, no one knows right yeah. now. Uh, we don't know what, how it's going to work or not. Yeah. yeah. I have like two, three hours for both my kids to go, you know. So I'm trying to figure out like Sunday morning, you know, Saturday, you know, what, you know, what would be good. I think there's going to be an initial rush. Right. Um, last time we did the Mini Maker Fair, there was a big rush right in the morning. And by the afternoon, it thinned out quite a bit. Uh -huh. um, so if 